So welcome to this solo playthrough of the Dungeons & Dragons classic, Lost Mine of Fandelver. This is the second episode in which our party ventures into Cragmore Hideout in a bid to rescue Gundren and Sildar, who have been kidnapped by goblins. I hope you enjoy it, and please do let me know in the comments. And if you do, remember to subscribe so you can catch the whole series. Last time, our party was ambushed on the tribal trail by a group of goblins, but Merrick turned the tables on the ambush and the party easily defeated the goblins. Torga is then distraught when she realises that the horses they have found lying dead on the trail belong to her cousin Gundren. Bandros spots signs on the ground that a group of goblins headed away to the northwest, dragging Gundren and his travelling companion Sildar with them. We join our adventurers in the midst of an argument about where to go next. Toraga stamps her foot. There's no way I'm going to Fandalin now. If we don't try to rescue Gundren and he dies because of it, I just couldn't live with myself. Her face is twisted with emotion and rage. I'll go on my own if I have to. Targar, it's okay. You don't have to go alone. I'll come with you, says Vandross. There is an uncomfortable silence for a few moments. Then Valanthe speaks. Well, it's clear that Torga is not going to leave here without searching for Gundren. And I am not willing to continue on this trail without a healer. Who knows, there may be more goblins just around the corner. So I will join you in your quest to follow the goblins and save Gundren. They all look at Merrick. He scowls. All right, all right, he says. You're likely going to need me anyway. So Torga and Vandross lead the horse and cart off the trail and tie the horse up at a tree. Meanwhile, Merrick goes round and loots all the goblins. He finds a surprisingly large amount of coin for three goblins, which he stuffs into his pockets. Hold on a minute, says Valanthe. You must share out anything you find, Merrick. We're all in this together now. Oh, so Miss Hoity Toity isn't above a bit of loot grabbing then, says Merrick. Valanthe glares at him as he shares out the loot. How did you find so much coin on those goblins, Merrick? asks Vandross. They don't call me Mary the Lucky for nothing, you know. So the four of them scramble up the embankment and push their way through the dense thicket. Soon the track opens out and they are walking uphill along a trail through a forest of majestic old oak trees. Now they're off the main track, let's do a season and weather check to see what kind of conditions they encounter. For the month, we roll a 7, so it is July. For the weather, we roll a 14, so it is a fine summer's day, warm but not too hot. The warmth of the midday sun penetrates even here in the dense forest, but the tree canopy provides them with some shade and protects them from the full heat of the day. The leaf litter scrunches under their feet, birds twitter in the trees, and occasional small animals scurry across the path. Vandross takes the lead. He has his longbow ready in case of attack. He uses his survival skills to follow the goblin tracks and also to look out for traps and any further ambush. Torga and Valanthe follow, with Merrick scuffing along rather reluctantly at the rear. After about 10 minutes of walking up the track, Vandross spots a snare trap that's been laid by the goblins to waylay anybody that follows them. Watch out, he says. There's a loop of rope hidden here among the leaves. He finds a stout branch fallen by the side of the path and picks it up and pokes it at the loop of rope. The rope is suddenly pulled taut and the branch is yanked upwards out of Vandross's grasp and ends up hanging about 10 feet above the track. Oh, well done, Vandross, says Torga. I wouldn't fancy ending up in that. A further 10 minutes along the path and they come to a section of the track which is densely covered with leaf litter on top of some dead branches. Vandross rolls a nine for perception. Hmm, he says. It looks like the debris from a tree that was blown over last winter. He doesn't see the danger lurking here. As he steps forward into the area, the branches snap and give way under his foot. There is a large pit below that the goblins have dug into the path. He makes a dexterity saving throw of 12. He teeters on the edge of the pit for a moment and then manages to pull himself back and avoids falling in. Whoa, that was a very cleverly hidden trap, he says. Yes, we mustn't underestimate these goblins, says Torga. The party follows the track up the hill for five miles. They emerge from the forest and see the mouth of a cave up ahead in the hillside. As they approach, they can see a shallow stream flowing out of the cave. A narrow dry path leads into the darkness on the right-hand side of the stream. In front of the cave, the goblins have hollowed out a small area in the briar thickets to form a lookout post. Wooden planks flatten out the briars and provide room for guards to lie hidden and watch the area, including a pair of goblins lurking there right now. 
Vandross wades through the shallow stream and the others start to follow. The sound of the splashing water alerts the goblins who had not been paying attention earlier. They make a cry of alarm, eh? which warns the party to their presence. So we roll for initiative. Valance swiftly moves to get a clear line of sight. She casts Ray of Frost. The icy missile strikes the goblin with pinpoint accuracy. The freezing blast causes the goblin to slow down, its movements hindered by the chilling effects of the spell. This goblin then rushes towards Vandross with its scimitar held high. However, the attack proves hasty and uncoordinated. The blade cuts through the air with a swishing sound, missing its mark by a wide margin. Not being able to see Valanthe fully, the second goblin targets Torga instead. Drawing its crude bow, the goblin releases an arrow with surprising accuracy, striking Torga square in the chest. The arrow pierces her armour, inflicting a painful wound, and causes her to stagger backward. He then attempts to duck down and hide in a thicket, but he fails. Even Merrick can see him just lurking behind the bushes. Vandross, determined to retaliate against the goblin in front of him, raises his mighty greatsword. However, the blade just whistles through the air as the goblin nimbly sidesteps the attack. Then Merrick moves forward and crosses the shallow river. He attempts to hit the first goblin with a sneak attack while he's engaged with Vandross. But he mistimes this as he emerges from the water and his blade fails to hit. Damn it, he says. Toraga, fueled by righteous determination, casts sacred flame on the goblin lurking in the thicket. However, the cover of the bushes make it harder for her to target. As the divine flames descend, the goblin neatly dodges, avoiding the attack. Valanthe again casts Ray of Frost, this time at the goblin in the thicket. Despite the goblin's cover within the thick foliage, the freezing beam of cold energy streaks through the air and strikes it squarely, wounding the goblin and slowing it. The first goblin strikes at Vandross again, and this time the blade connects with a resounding impact, slicing through Vandross's armour and badly wounding him. This unexpectedly strong attack brings his hit points perilously low. The second goblin then emerges from the thicket to support its partner in the lookout. It brandishes its weapon with reckless abandon, and the scimitar slips from its grip, arcing through the air and landing on the ground with a thud. Vandross swings his greatsword again. The blade slices through the goblin's defences, cleaving deep into its flesh. With a final gasp, the goblin slumps to the ground. <coughs> Vandross then uses Second Wind. A surge of vitality courses through his body and he regains 11 hit points. He then closes in on the second goblin. Merrick is able to use a sneak attack. With a swift and silent strike, Merrick's weapon finds its mark. The blade pierces through the goblin's guard, finding a vital spot that instantly kills the creature and it collapses to the ground. <coughs> With the threat extinguished, Vandross proceeds to search the goblins for loot. He finds 12 copper on the first one, and then Merrick jumps in and finds 13 gold on the second. How can that be? says Vandross. Lucky Merrick strikes again. Share it out, says Torga. Merrick does so, but he keeps the extra one gold for himself. Vandross then goes to share out the copper. It's okay, says Torga. You can keep that, as she notices Vandross's shabby gear. They decide to stop for a short rest. Torga regains six hit points, and Vandross regains his second wind. They look around the outpost while they rest. Quite a clever setup they have here, says Torga. These goblins are well organised. Now refreshed, the adventurers head on into the cave. They carefully make their way along the narrow path on the east side of the tumbling stream. Vandross goes first, then Merrick, who is feeling a bit cheerier now after his lucky loot, followed by Torga and then Valanthe. As they enter, they are immediately hit by the contrast of the cool damp air in the cave, which carries a faint scent of earth and mildew. The noise of the constant rushing of the stream fills the air, and the sound of dripping water echoes through the cavern. The darkness looms ahead of them, and in the shadows they can make out stalactites and stalagmites forming jagged natural sculptures that glisten with moisture. Just inside the cave mouth, on the eastern side, a few uneven stone steps lead up to a small dank chamber off the main passage. This cave narrows to a steep fissure at the far end and is filled with the stench of animals. As they approach, the sound of savage snarls and rattling chains greets them. There are three wolves chained up just inside the opening. Each wolf's chain leads to an iron rod driven to the base of a stalagmite. Oh, the poor things, says Torga. These goblins are awful in the way they treat their animals. Both Torga and Vandross attempt to pacify the wolves so they can pass through the chamber safely. So we roll an animal handling check. Vandross gets 11 and Torga gets 6. Vandross steps forward, his hands outstretched in a friendly manner. It's okay, doggies. We're friendly. But the wolves snap and snarl even more. Oh, I knew we should have brought some of that horse meat, says Merrick. 
That would have kept them quiet. However, even with the wolves snarling loudly, the goblins of Cragmore Hideout don't seem to be alerted. Not sure if it's worth going this way anyway, says Vandross as he peers into the back of this cavern. Philanthe casts dancing lights. Four glowing orbs of light appear and float above them, illuminating the area. Vandross rolls an eight for perception. Even with the increased light levels, he still can't see anything of note at the back of the wolf's den. It looks like a dead end, but there is too much shadow to be sure. They decide to move on up the main tunnel. The main passage from the cave mouth climbs steeply upward, the stream plunging and splashing down its west side. In the shadows, a side passage leads west across the other side of the stream. They peer ahead into the gloom on the lookout for further goblins. The place seems strangely quiet so far. In the shadows of the ceiling to the north, those with dark vision can just make out the dim shape of a rickety bridge of wood and rope crossing over the passage ahead, about 20 feet above the cavern floor. Torga rolls a 21 for perception. She makes a motion for the group to stop and be quiet. She points out the goblin standing on the bridge above them. Valanthe moves up the dancing lights so that Merrick and Vandross can also see. However, this alerts the goblin to their presence and it starts to move off the bridge towards the east. Torga responds quickly and casts Sacred Flame, sending Holy Fire cascading towards the retreating goblin. However, it is too fast, and the flames sear the bridge just behind it, damaging the weak structure. Philanthe then immediately casts Ray of Frost, but the goblin is already moving quickly away, and she fails to hit it. The blast of frost splatters onto the cave wall behind, leaving a patch of ice shards. The goblin disappears out of sight, into a passage on the eastern side. Quick! says Vandross. Let's try to get him before he warns any others that we're here. And he runs up the passage and tries to climb up onto the bridge. He rolls an 18 for athletics. He easily manages to scale the cave wall and swings himself up onto the bridge. Torga moves up the passage and tries to follow him, but the rock is too slippery for her to get a handhold. She watches Vandross from below. Can you see where he went? She says in a loud whisper. From his vantage point on the bridge, Vandross can see that the stream passage continues, bending eastward as it goes, and he can hear the gushing sound of a waterfall coming from a larger cavern beyond. He then peers down the passage to the east, trying to see where the goblin went, but the light rapidly fades out up here, and without dark vision, this direction is almost completely dark to him. With the increased light below, the others see a rubble-strewn passage to their left across the stream. Merrick goes over to investigate, to see if there's an alternative path that avoids the goblins. He rolls an 11 for perception, the passage ascends steeply to the west, but again without dark vision, he cannot see very far. Luke Valanthe, he says, there's another path up here. But Valanthe ignores him and walks on up the main passage. The passage is suddenly filled with a mighty roar as a huge surge of rushing water pours down from above. The crashing flood completely fills the passage and the party is in danger of being washed away. Vandross watches aghast from his position safely on the bridge above. Torga tries to grab at a wooden post which supports the bridge from below. She rolls a 22 for strength. She manages to hold on as the water rushes past her. Merrick is standing in the rubble on the west side of the stream. He tries to dodge back into the passage to avoid the water. He rolls a 15 for dexterity, so he just manages to avoid being swept away. Valanthe is on the main path with no areas of protection nearby. She uses all her strength to try and brace against the rush of the water. She rolls a one. She is knocked down flat by the flood and carried all the way back down to the bottom and out of the cave. She takes damage as she is bruised and battered by this fall. The cavern goes dark again as the dancing lights blink out. Valanthe, cries Torga, and she rushes back down the passage to see if Valanthe is all right. Vandross peers back down the passage but can see nothing in the darkness. He gets a torch out and lights it. As he looks down, he can only see Merrick standing in the rubble on the far side of the passage. With the flood subsided, Merrick then makes his way up the passage. He attempts to climb up to the safety of the bridge. He rolls a 17 for athletics. Despite having little skill in this area, he finds some lucky handholds and manages to climb up to the bridge. Meanwhile, Valanthe has picked herself up. She is not badly hurt, more humiliated at being the only one washed down the passage. She meets up with Torga as she comes back in. Are you okay? says Torga. Don't fuss, says Valanthe. I'm fine. The two of them make their way back into the cave and up the passage. When Valanthe sees that the passage is in darkness again, she casts dancing lights. Three goblins now emerge from the east to check if the flood was successful in washing out the intruders. Two come down the main tunnel and one along the side passage. 
One of the goblins is successfully stealthed, but the other two can be seen by the party. Wait, what's that? says Vandross as he sees a goblin approaching the bridge from below. The goblins are back, so we roll for initiative. Merrick takes the lead. He raises his short bow and draws an arrow. It whistles down from the bridge and strikes the goblin between the eyes. It is killed instantly. Merrick grins. Torga runs back up the passage to just below the bridge. She peers up the passage, but with a perception roll of six, she cannot see the other goblin stealth there. Now there is more light, Vandross puts out his torch and takes out his longbow, but he also cannot see the stealth goblin in the passage. Seeing its fellow goblins now dead and that there are intruders again in the tunnel, the other two goblins retreat away again to the east. Philanthe picks her way back up the tunnel, but she is wary, so she waits by the rubble shelf. As Merrick can see no more goblins below the bridge, he creeps along the tunnel to the east. He rolls a 23 for stealth. He emerges into a large cavern where two goblins are hurriedly removing the stones to release a second flood. They do not see him lurking in the shadows behind them. Torga decides to dash further up the main tunnel. Come on everyone, let's charge them, she says. Vandross creeps along the tunnel following Merrick. He remains in the shadows so the goblins cannot see him. The two goblins remove the final stones holding back the water. A second flood of surging water rushes down the tunnel. This time, Belanthe is in the relative safety of the rocky ledge. She just manages to succeed on a dexterity throw and steps away from the water in time as it goes past. She uses her action to move double speed up the tunnel. Somehow, she still manages to do this gracefully. All the party have now made it to the top of the flood. This cavern is half filled with two now drained pools of water. A narrow waterfall high in the eastern wall feeds these pools, which drain out forming the stream that flows out of the cave mouth below. The goblins have built low stone walls to serve as dams holding the water in. The sound of the waterfall echoes through the cavern, drowning out all other noise. Merrick is standing in the shadows on the western side of the cavern, unobserved by the two goblins. He silently raises his short bow and knocks an arrow. The projectile streaks through the air, swift and deadly. It strikes the unsuspecting goblin in the back. And with the increased damage from a sneak attack, the goblin is killed instantly and it slumps to the floor. <coughs> Torga casts Sacred Flame on the second goblin. The light of the spell dances across the cave walls. The goblin attempts to dodge the incoming flames. But its reflexes fail and the holy fire engulfs the goblin, severely wounding it. Vandross then charges towards this goblin, his greatsword drawn with the intent to finish it off. However, his boot catches on a large stone and he stumbles forward. He clumsily swings the greatsword, the strike landing with a clang on the stone floor. Behind him, Merrick snickers and thinks to himself, what a complete noob this guy is. The badly wounded goblin uses disengage to escape from Vandross and runs as fast as it can into the shadows of a cave to the south. The party follow in pursuit. Merrick stops to loot the goblin. This time he gets 19 copper. He pockets all the copper before the others notice. Vandross takes the lead, heading up the stone steps into a large cave to the south. Across the far side of the cave, they can see piles of sacks and crates of provisions that the goblins have looted from traders travelling on the tribal trail. To the west, the floor slopes towards a narrow opening that descends down into darkness. In the middle of the cavern, the coals of a large fire smoulder. The cave is occupied by the leader of the Cragmore goblins, Clark the Bugbear, along with his wolf Ripper and some more goblins. Already alerted to the party's presence, the bugbear and goblins attempt to hide, hoping to ambush them. Clark and his wolf are successful in their stealth and are well hidden behind some large stalagmites. The goblins take cover behind the piles of supplies, but can be clearly seen by the adventurers. So we roll for initiative. Vandross leads the attack and swiftly pursues the fleeing goblin into the cave, his greatsword gleaming in the firelight. He quickly closes the distance and brings his blade crashing down on the wounded goblin, leaving it lifeless on the cold cave floor. <coughs> he then uses his remaining movement to heroically rush towards the goblins that he can see lurking behind the crates. The cornered goblins then slash at Vandross with their scimitars, but in their panic, each one fails the attack. The second goblin nearly hits its fellow standing close by. There's a further goblin lurking amongst the crates behind Vandross on the east side of the cave. Seizing the opportune moment, this goblin attacks with advantage using its short bow and shoots an arrow which strikes Vandross in the back. Merrick then follows, and seeing Vandross shot in the back, he rushes the goblin at the eastern wall. That's a dirty lowdown trick, he cries, forgetting that shooting people from behind is his favourite tactic. Merrick is now wielding two swords, his short sword in the main hand, and in his offhand a scimitar which he looted from a goblin earlier. 
He strikes using his short sword and wounds the goblin so badly he doesn't even need to use the scimitar. The goblin goes down with a strangled cry. <coughs> Clark the bugbear then sets his wolf on Vandross. Go, Ripper! Show these weaklings the might of Clark! The wolf launches itself out of the shadows at Vandross. <laughs> However, despite the advantage of attacking from stealth, it misses, its jaws snapping harmlessly in the air in front of Vandross. The menacing figure of Clark the bugbear then seizes the opportunity to strike from the shadows. With a low growl, Clark hurls a javelin across the cavern, aiming directly at Merrick, who stands unaware of the impending danger. The javelin cuts through the air with a haunting whistle. Merrick is instantly struck down and slumps to the floor. Ah, Clark will build a throne from your bones, puny ones. No, Merrick, shrieks Torga. As the tension in the cavern rises, Valanthe moves calmly to the centre of the space and casts sleep. The two remaining goblins in front of Vandross are overcome by an irresistible drowsiness. Their weapons slip from their grasp as they fall into a slumber. Turga then runs into the cave and shouts, Oh no you don't, you nasty beastie! She rushes straight up to Clark and casts Inflict Wounds. Her outstretched hand touches Clark's hulking form and she releases a blast of necrotic energy directly into the bugbear's body. A sickly blackness spreads across his flesh, and the bugbear staggers, visibly weakened by the attack. Who dares defy Clark? With the two goblins now sleeping, Vandross swiftly turns his attention to the snarling wolf behind him. The great sword slices into the wolf's flank with a sickening thud, and it drops to the ground, lifeless. <laughs> Merrick then succeeds at the first of three death-saving throws, but his life still hangs in the balance. Seeing that his wolf is now dead, and all the goblins are dead or sleeping, Clark turns tail and seeks escape through a narrow vertical passage that descends from the west end of the cavern. As it moves away, Torga takes the opportunity to strike it with her warhammer, but the bugbear's retreat is too swift and the hammer swooshes through the air. We roll a strength check for Clark as he attempts to climb down the chimney. We roll a 17, so he successfully descends halfway down. Seeing Clark's attempt to escape, Valanthe slips through the gaps between the stalagmites and casts Ray of Frost down the shaft of the bugbear. The icy missile streaks down the shaft and strikes Clark's retreating form, piercing him with frosty shards. His escape is now impeded as the cold slows his movement. Clark will not be defeated! Go heal Merrick, Valanthe says to Torga. I've got this. Torga runs over to Merrick and kneels by his side. She casts Cure Wounds. The healing energy brings Merrick back from the brink of death and heals much of the damage done by the bugbear's javelin. Vandross then moves to support Valanthe in preventing the bugbear's escape. He takes up his longbow and shoots straight down the shaft. The arrow sings through the air and finds its mark, piercing the bugbear's flesh with a resounding thud. Clark is killed and crashes down the shaft. As it falls, they hear its final words. Ah, Clark! joins the great Rugek in battle. Ah, may he be worthy. Then they all hear the sound of the wolves below starting to go into a frenzy as fresh meat drops into their lair. The commotion dies down as all the enemies are vanquished. Toroga and Vandros then quickly run over to the sleeping goblins and tie them up with lengths of rope before they wake from their slumber. Toroga then remembers why they have come to Cragmore Hideout. But where's Gundren? Where's Silda? They must be here somewhere. She starts to frantically look around the cavern. And this is where we will leave our adventurers, with the leader of the Cragmore Goblins successfully defeated, but still no sign of the kidnapped Gundren and Silda. Tune again next time to discover what other challenges the Goblin Hideout holds for our adventurers.